Good morning. This Good is morning, February sir. 11th in the year 2003. We're in Natick, Massachusetts. And this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates. Our cameraman is Robert Dunbar. And this morning we have with us Warren Donovan. Warren, we're very ha happy to have you with us. May I begin by asking you when you were born? I was born on uh, June 7, 1915. And where, where were you born? In Westport, Massachusetts. Westport, down on the coast? Right. And what is your current address? Acton, Massachusetts. And marital status? Uh, my wife passed away last year. I'm very sorry to hear that. Do you have children, Warren? Four. Four children? Where and when did you enter the military? I entered it in Boston in uh, March of 1941. And how did you come to go in? Were you uh, part of the draft? Uh, I was a lucky number winner in the draft. So you were drafted in March of 41. That's right. um, just a few months before Pearl Harbor. That's right. Um, did you have any choices as to what service you went into? At that time, no. We went into the field artillery. You were just told you were in the Army. Right. That was it. When you went into the service, did you go in um, by yourself? Or were there other people with you that from school or some of your acquaintances? No, I was alone. And where did you go when the Army uh, said I went come? to uh, Fall River and then uh, down to Camp Edwards, down on the Cape Cod. Is that for your basic training? That's right. Tell us a little bit about that. What happened to you there? Well, at that time, uh, we were tremendously unready for military service. Uh, we would have to have wooden guns. We didn't have clothing. We didn't have bullets. We didn't have vehicles. It was really stunning to how unprepared we were. The United States Army. That's right. It, are these the old newsreels we've seen of uh, trucks going by and on them the, the side of it is painted tank? That's and correct. And you run after them that, with broomsticks. So um, your notes originally that I have read, um, which I found enormously uh, cogent, you said you described your basic training as much confusion. That's right. Is, is it that the officers didn't know what they were doing or the, nobody seemed to know what was happening? We had only a, a, a few who had any experience, certainly wartime experience, and uh, they were all relatively new because we were expanding so fast at that time. Um, fortunately, we went for uh, two months of training down in North Carolina to Fort Bragg and lived out all that time, uh, camped out all that time and went through maneuvers. We had some uh, army officers there. And by the time we came back, we looked a little bit like a military organization. We came back in December. Aside from the c confusion at Camp Edwards, um, did you feel that you learned anything? Really, it, about being a soldier or oh, yes. oh, basic yeah. we infantry tactics? To, we understood like what it was to sleep out. We understood by the time we came back from North Carolina, we understood what we were felt going to face if we, st if we stayed in the field artillery. How did you wind up in the artillery? Of all the jobs in the Army you might have been assigned to, how, how, how would you get to that one? I don't know how that was done. They, did they just it. need a quota yeah, and, they, and you were it. Yes, right. Tell us a little bit about learning to fire artillery. Well, I was not uh, involved in firing any of it. As a matter of fact, we never fired any guns really until the very end. We didn't, didn't have the ammunition. It was all fake. What so, size guns were you a using? 75 millimeter, which is about three inches. And were, were these... Um, Infantry weapons, anti-tech weapons, what was the purpose of your, your fire? 
Well, the particular unit I was, I was a driver at first, uh, and we had uh, a, a, what they call an anti-tank uh, mm -hmm. section, and uh, we had the smaller guns, like about uh, 25 millimeters or something like that. And uh, they were we they were towed they were towed behind trucks and our job was to protect the big guns, the you know the three inch guns, seventy five millimeters. Against uh, other infantry or something? Uh, well, who were you protecting mostly, against? Mostly mostly the uh, artillery is to soften up some spot the infantry is going to attack, ahead of the infantry, prepare it for entrance so to speak. And you were down there f until December. So where were you on December 7th, 1941? In December 7th, 1941, we had just returned to Camp Edwards from North Carolina. And uh, on a Saturday, I believe it was, the word came through about Pearl Harbor. We were supposed to be out in a year, but I think even before Pearl Harbor, that year was going to evaporate and become many more. But at any rate, uh, that changed the outlook on all of us. We were going to be in for the real thing now. So your understanding when you were drafted and, and picked up by the Army was you were going to be out in a year, and then you were told one morning, I gather, that you're in for the duration, which is a big difference. Indeed. In fact, they had a song, Goodbye Dear, I'll be back in a year. Right. Goodbye, Mom, Mom, off to Yokohama. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did you get any uh, advanced training beyond what you've just described to us? No. At that time, uh, like several of my friends, or the three, three friends I had, two friends, three of us, joined uh, or tried to join the Air Force. The Air Force was taking people then. Uh, at one time, you had to have a full four years of uh, college and then you went another four years in the military training, but this they had to speed it up. So um, we we joined the Air Force, and by August of uh, that next year, forty-two. That was December, August of uh, forty-two. Forty-two. I I was in Kelly Field, Texas. Okay, that's quite a, a transition. How did you? What was the process by which you went to your commanding officer and said, I want to get out of the Army and join the Air Force? Or were they, uh, where on paper did you make this transition? Well, just about that way, we went to the um, major <clears throat> and said that we wanted to transfer to the Air Force, and he said, okay. And uh, so that, that was the process. It was very simple. Did many but, of your men in your outfit do the same thing? Uh, well, uh, at least these three did, and I think some others did. Uh, these three, I mean, me and the other two. Yeah. Um, but we had to go through a series of physical tests that wiped out quite a few. You know, eyesight is so important in the, mil in the military for fighter planes. <coughs> and. Um, and of course, they have this uh, test, the uh, educational test. You had to have the equivalent of a college education uh, to be accepted to go in the Air Force. Warren, when you wanted to go into the Air Force, what was your dream? What did you want to do in the Air Force? What did you want to fly? Uh, I wasn't that enthusiastic as my two friends. They were kind of wild to get into the, and they, they had some experience. I had not had any flying experience, but they just said, why don't you come along? And I said, well, sure, I'll go along. What difference does it make? So we went in, and when it came through, when it was finished, we finished the six or eight, nine months, I've forgotten what it was now, uh, I was the only one selected as a pilot. They were both became navigators. And what had they wanted to be? They wanted to fly, yes. do wild things. That's right. How did you feel about becoming a pilot? Uh, I thought it was all right. I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't crazy about flying, but I was able to do as well as most. 
about it, so. You've moved through very rapidly through um, about six months of your military career here. Can you tell us briefly here how they take you, a civilian, and in six months you're flying planes? Well, how we do that is, as I recall, we, we went through a lot of uh, ground school, a lot of it, and uh, which included investigating the workings of airplanes, sitting in an airplane, and uh, remembering all of the uh, uh, guiles and things that are in an airplane. If you ever looked into, at a pilot of it, in there, you know what it is. Uh, and you had to remember every one of those so you could do it blindfolded. You could turn on this, turn on that, start the engine with it with a blindfold. And uh, that kind of training is uh, fast. Uh, is what got us to where we were, to, to able to fly. Of course, then the, the real, real training came after that beginning. First, you fly in a, a Piper Cub, which is a little small plane. They get 40 hours in the air, 40, 50 hours, I've forgotten which. Then you move up to a second plane, second level plane, much faster and so forth. I've forgotten the names of those, but no. And then you move up to the, well, well, you're going to be a fighter pilot, you move up to the fighter, training fighter, whereas, of course, the bomber pilots moved up to bombers, so they were in a different category. Can you think back to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, going through this training, was your eye on Europe or the Pacific or was the Air Force's eye on either the Pacific Theater or the European Theater? Did you think you'd go out to the Pacific? When uh, I finished, which was uh, just about Pearl Harbor time, uh, it, it, it looked as though, at that time, it looked as though we were going to go to Europe because uh, before Pearl Harbor there was no, no real threat that, that we knew of. Uh, we all figured we'd be going to England, uh, which we did. When you finally got your wings uh, that wonderful day where you're commissioned a second lieutenant, uh, what was the first big real plane that you flew. I don't mean any of the trainers, but what did they put you into then? Uh, when I went through the three trainers, uh, I was still a, a fighter pilot, and uh, I got transferred to the P-47. That We were the first class to move into the P-47. It was brand new. This was the Thunderbolt, I think. That's the yeah. Thunderbolt. Would you describe that plane for us, that huge radial engine and the rest yeah. of the armament that you had? That plane was a very heavy plane. It had 2,000 horsepower engine. And when you sat in it, of course, we always landed. We didn't land on the front wheels, you know. Back in those days, you had a, you stalled it, stalled the airplane. When you sat in it, you couldn't see where you, you couldn't see ahead. You had to look out the side. The, the engine was so big, and we had eight 50 caliber guns on that aircraft. So it was a, it was a big and difficult plane compared to what we had been flying. It was kind of heavy and logy, and um, they had no seat for anybody else. There was only one seat in those aircrafts. No pilot, no trainer seat. So when you landed that the first time, you landed it alone. There was nobody. See, most of the training was done with a pilot behind you. But in the P-47, you they talked you down. And it was it was not easy because you don't once you get that thing in, in position to land, you've got to look out the side. So I know, You're looking at nothing but a big radial engine yeah. out there. What was the purpose of this plane? Was this um, to attack the, the German fighters or bombers or ground installations? What was it best suited for? Well, we, all of us there, we were in it. 
I finally, I finally had an accident and got out of it, but uh, not intentionally, but uh, went to the Bahamas. But uh, all of us there uh, figured that um, it was not going to be able to fight uh, with the German Falk Wolf or the Messerschmitts, who were ideal fighting planes. This was too heavy. But later on, we learned it was designed, apparently, we didn't know that, that it was designed for what, it, what they did. And it'll take me a minute, but I'll tell you what happened to the P-47 and why it became such a valuable plane. Because it had such firepower. 850 caliber guns were unheard of in those days. And it had high altitude. It could fly 40,000 feet with that aircraft. So uh, the way it came back is the bombers would be flying in in formation uh, to the target. And the German pilots would be attacking. They'd be coming up, coming up, so forth. Uh, they'd come up to meet the bombers. The P-47s would be about two or 3,000 feet, four of them, in a, in a flight, four, above the bombers. When the, when the German fighter starts up, two went down. And, and they, they were coming down at almost the speed of sound. They go for 100 miles an hour or more. And they'd give them a burst of those 50s, and that was the end of that German. And they went down, turned around, the other guys were up above, the other two were ready. So they'd come down again, and the others would go up. So for protecting the bombers, they were ideal. Isn't this also the plane that when you see the newsreels of shooting up trains, yeah. flak towers, yes. isn't this the plane that you're describing? That That's right. It was then, just it, a flying machine yeah. gun to take out yeah. a whole train. That's right. It had such firepower. And they, a lot of them were used later on when the P-51 came along, which was a much more maneuverable and a better airplane all for flying. Uh, the, P, uh, the, uh, the 47s became more uh, ground strafers. Isn't it also true, though, that they, they had a uh, heck of a casualty rate? A lot, of, uh, yeah. a lot of guys were killed in these things. Indeed. A very high-powered yeah. plane. Yes, that's right. It was hard to fly. It was not an easy airplane to fly. Tell us about going overseas. Uh, we've jumped into the plane itself, but uh, you ta said a minute ago that you shifted into bombers. Yes. How did that come about? Well, it came about because of the situation in Europe as much as anything, uh, that the uh, they had decided they were going to bomb Germany out of the war, apparently. And uh, at that time, what with the flak that the Germans had perfected as anti-aircraft <coughs> fire, and the fighter planes that they had on hand, uh, our bombers were really getting beaten up something fierce. The losses, losses were tremendous. So we had to, if we were going to bomb them out of the war, we had to get more bombers over there and more pilot, you know, pilots on bombers. So uh, I think that was the main reason of the, uh, of the shift of emphasis. Did you volunteer to go into bombers or did they uh, Yes, I again, volunteered to go okay. in. Uh, uh, my friend said, you know, when we get out of this thing, uh, we might want to fly airplanes. And uh, you're not going to make a living flying a fighter airplane. He said, uh, you know, what you ought to do is to transfer like I'm going to do. Before, but he did, he did it. Yeah, I'm going to transfer to the bombers and I'm learn something about that. So uh, it, it had an effect on me. And then I had this accident and then uh, a combination of those uh, induced me to go the other way. Can you tell us uh, about this? Accident? Yes, it was. Uh, it was in Westover Field, Massachusetts, and these lightning storms come up very fast. And uh, I was on a Sunday, I was flying. I, it asked me to come down and fly with another uh, student. And um, they lost, it, it was uh, struck, I guess, but anyway, we lost every communication. We just got one, one uh, signal on the radio saying, every plane in the sky get down. 
and then it went dead. So you had no way to, you didn't, you, when you approaching the landing uh, strip, you had no communications. The lights were out and so forth, so you couldn't talk to the guy or anything. But we were all trying to get down as fast as we could. Now, I, I pulled down, got it down, I got it lined up, I'm looking out the side of the, uh, the canopy, because that's what you had to do. And suddenly it was it. Ran right over another aircraft that was, had landed short, apparently. <clears throat> well, they said it was short. There were other men that were flying in the sky. I didn't see him. And uh, he was killed immediately. Big propeller tube. Yeah, so you in effect crashed onto another plane because yeah. you couldn't see the runway in front yeah. of you. Yeah. And at that point you decided this is not for me. Yeah, I decided I'd been thinking about it. I had asked to be out before, Bill, for the prior reason that I told you, that I thought I ought to get some experience. Yeah. But then with that, and with the need for bomber pilots, they were transferring them whether they wanted to or not, because of what I have formally told you. So those two things created the reason why I went to bombers. When you went into bombers, or said that you were interested in going into bombers, could you pick uh, 24s, 25s, 26s, 17s, Do you, did you have any choice that way? At that time, no, because they were preparing uh, uh, the, uh, the bomb, 384th Bomb Group to go overseas. And so we were, a number of us, were moved right down, they were oh, within two months of going overseas, and we went in as co-pilots. On B seventeen. B seventeens. There was no no asked would you like to do, sir, or any of that. We just went we did what we were told. So now you're learning to pick up a four engine plane That's right. and fly it around. Right. How long does it take you to uh, feel comfortable in flying in a thing like that? Um, fortunately I had a, a good ability um, for uh, uh, flying uh, formation. In fact, I had, was about to be, become a, a, a squadron leader at, uh, at Westover Field because of um, my ability, which not everybody has, I, I guess. But because of that, uh, the training, it, it doesn't take long. Once you can fly an airplane, uh, the only thing difference is it's bigger. you got four engines and you know, you got a little more stuff, but you got another man to help you. So it really isn't that, if you have the experience, the past experience, it isn't that bad. What was the rank of your pilot? If you were a second lieutenant, what was he? He was first lieutenant. First he lieutenant. was a first lieutenant when he first went overseas. He, he was a second lieutenant until about five or six missions. Did you fly your planes over? No. We went you over went by on, ship and picked them up on the yeah, other side. Yeah, we went on the Queen Elizabeth. Somebody ferried, ferried them over. Right. A lot of guys went over on that Queen Elizabeth. They sure did. <laughs> it would carry a lot. Yeah, <laughs> and move fast. Yeah. So when you, where did you get to? England? You, yeah. And uh, where was your field that you were sent to? It was, um, I can't think of the name, it'll come to me, but it was a, out north of where all of them were, that, that is northeast of London in that big area over there. And uh, uh, when we landed there, it was, it was just a couple of shacks, a few shacks to live in. And the weather was horrible and the mud was, was it was just, see, we weren't in November. And that's the rainy season over there. Is this and November now uh, of 40? This is, uh, had to be a 42. 42. Yes. So you're in England at the worst time of the year to be there. That's right. And um, were your planes waiting for you there? Uh, yes. Yeah. We, we were just filled. Um, they were bringing in the planes and bringing in the flyers as fast as they could. What about your crew? Were you a crew now? Um, Yes, I was a crew, 
when I got on the airplane. That, uh, on you the, had all your gunners, navigators, radio men. Yes, they were you all. You were a crew. Yeah, yeah, that was a crew. We went as a crew. We, we worked as a crew in, te in Texas where we trained. With the exception of, of a gunner who joined you later, is that? Oh, yes. Yeah, he, would, he had been sick or something. I forgot just what it was. We, we went with a, not with a regular man for a while. Something I've never asked in, 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 in this situation. Um, you're a crew for the first time. Is there any kind of a, you're, you're, you're bonding and uh -huh. you're becoming a team. Does the pilot sit down with you sometime and um, talk to you about survival or talk about attacking better or being the best airplane in the whole group. What's it like to be part of a team like this and, and starting out? Well, it's sort of automatic. You know what you have, you know what you're doing, and you know what's ahead. You know, it's, you're either going to be the best you can get or you're going to be dead. I mean, it's pretty self-evident. Uh, that you better be the best you can be. <laughs> so, well, there's we a very have. negative side to it, yeah. Yes. Were there, was there any interface with guys who had been over uh, flying uh, missions? Did they come down and talk to you? Yes, yeah, we had that. Yeah, we had one fellow who, uh, one pilot who uh, landed in the, what do you call it, channel, and was rescued. He and his crew was right. He, he set the aircraft down in the channel, which was quite a feat, because it was uh, he was already disabled from gunfire. Hmm. They the weather was so bad. Uh, to uh, one time to get the aircraft down, they, we got them out. At this time, I happened to be on the ground. The well and, and it sucked in so bad there that we just weren't going to get down. So they got a, a bunch of uh, barrels and filled them with fuel and set them afire. Stacked them all along the, both sides of the runway and set them afire so that they had this line of fire to get the aircraft down. There were almost as many people killed in landings and uh, collisions and so forth as there were otherwise. Can you tell us about uh, going on your first combat mission in a B-17 bomber? Talking about uh, the night before you're, you're put on alert, the next morning you go into the briefing. Can you start at the briefing and tell us about that day? Well, we get up very early, of course, for 4 o'clock in the morning, and we would have a, a real egg for breakfast. That was kind of a reward for A real to, egg? A real egg. One egg? Yeah. Well, yeah, you had spam. What do you call that? Those fake eggs. Uh, other than that, you got a real egg for breakfast, and then uh, the group goes down to the uh, center, the uh, center of where they are going to be of the unit, and they have a meeting room there. And we all go in and sit down. This is early in the morning now, maybe about five o'clock, and everybody sits there holding on, waiting for. This map that to is that are huge maps in front of you that they're going to uncover. You don't know, so everybody's where the hell are we going? Where are we going? And you know, you're wondering, are you going on a milk run or you're going on the real thing? Or, so you're kind of nervous sitting there. And then the guy snatches the thing back, and uh, there it lies. And you look, and you, oh Bremen, oh good, look at Carvin. We're going there, Stuttgart, Stuttgart. We knew every, you know, all those Bremen, we knew every one of them. Or Schweinfurt. Yeah. Yeah. Regenshaven. Uh, Some of those ones deep in. Yes. Uh, what was your first first run? Uh, I don't think, I think it was Bremen, which was not too bad. We had it pretty it's good. It's just across the channel, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that wasn't too bad. Were places known for being really tough in terms of anti-aircraft fire? Oh, yes. Or fighter coverage, depending on the target. 
what, really what value the Germans put on the uh, place. Ludwig Thaven and uh, other uh, Bremen and some of those that were uh, in what they call the Ruhr Valley, where they, all their manufacturing was, the Ruhr River. Uh, that was Flack Alley. We call it Flack Alley. Because you, you get over there, you'd be sitting there driving this airplane along and your fighters are around you, you know, and the guys are trying to keep them off. And you look ahead and you see this black cloud. And you've got to fly right through it. The fighters, our own fighters, well, if they're, they're protecting us, and the Germans attacking fighters, they just turn off. They're not going to fly through that flak. Just you, your carrier, and the, your, that's the B-17s, so the bombers are going to fly through the flak. It, and the flak is because there's so much in the air, so much metal in the air, and, and shells exploding, it looks black. And I, so, you know, you're going to just sit there. What can you do? You just but, sit there and hope to hell that the guy, the, the bombardier, hits it the first time. But if he doesn't, if he can't see it, you go round again. And if that isn't it, you've got to go right back around and go right through that same thing again. That is something. <laughs> This, this is a very obvious question, but can you describe the structure of the box you were flying in as a combat formation made for B-17s, self-protecting, and the penalties that acquired here if that formation was broken or if you had to leave it because you were hit? Can you talk about that? Yeah, I know that well, because we had to do that. I can explain that to you, what happened to Would me. Would you please? We were flying, we were losing so many airplanes. They said 5%, uh, they, they could survive with 5% loss every mission. So if you send out 20 airplanes, you lost two. But next day you lost two more, <laughs> so forth. So um, we were flying. Every, every, every kind of airplane we could get, we were going up. And, and, the men, and the men who repaired them at night, the aircraft was repaired at night with those ground crew. They did tremendous work, the ground crews. They don't get the credit that they deserve. But anyway, we got just about over the Rhine River, I think, almost to the Rhine River. and. Uh, going along fine, we lost an engine. So we had to decide, do we feather it and keep on, you know, stop the propeller, that's what feather means. Uh, do we do that and keep on or do we go back? Well, I felt, so did the pilot, God, we got this far, we're going to get up, we're going to get fighters anyway if we get, get out of it, let's go on. So we feathered it, and, and, and we didn't know it, but this was with a new group, as I was saying. We went with our own group because there was so many losses. We, they decided they were going to bomb at 4,000 feet higher. So we tried to climb 4,000 feet on three engines with a bomb load, and the other engine went out. Well, as soon as that engine went out, we had another decision to make. What do we do? Do we what do we do? So we said, let's take a, ask this, the navigator for a heading to Switzerland. We can't going to get home. We can't keep up with the crew. We're left on our own, so let's head for a neutral country. Well, we didn't, out, when two minutes were out of formation when they began to fight us. And, uh, well, within within 15, we were at about 25,000 feet at that stage, and uh, with two engines. It wasn't long before we had three, one engine, number three went. There we were. You're flying on one engine now. Going down, not not even you know we knew it. We we're going to go down. Yeah. So I said to I, I'll continue a little bit more of this. You want or I can. <clears throat> wait till you ask more questions. Well, I'd like to ask you what it's like to be a pilot. Um, 
whose strict orders are to maintain formation and everybody, it, were you all bombing uh, at the same time or bombing as individuals? Well, it went with groups like 20 airplanes would be our 384th group. And did, did, did uh, you get a signal for when to drop your bombs or did you watch a lead plane? Yeah, lead plane usually. Okay. Usually the lead plane would drop and we'd drop on the lead plane. How close is this formation? You as a pilot, you're yeah. looking out at a wingtip. Yeah. How far away is that guy? Not very far, 25 feet, so. You had to keep it in close, and you had to keep the structure, the layers, so that you had, uh, say you had uh, six airplanes in a, in a squadron. Mm -hmm. You had to have it so all of the guns would shoot one way or the other without hitting the other guys in the squadron. Mm -hmm. So you had to have be pretty good formation flying to stay in there. For hours at a time. That's right. When you and your pilot, uh-oh, uh three engines go out, do you contact anybody and discuss it with them, or are you on your own? You've got to make the decisions. All, the, all we did was wire, call back and say, we got lost all our engines and we're going to go to Switzerland. And then we lo even lost that. Well, right then, by that time, when you're, on, you're not going to stay up very long when you lose that last engine. Yeah. So I can continue with on. Or you want me to spend a little more time on that? Yes, if you would. So I said to Jack Lawson, he was a pilot, I said, you go out the front. There's a way to go out the front. And we had no communication or anything now. See, they shot out. We didn't know what was happening back there. Back of your back, back in the bomber. Yeah. Uh, we know the bombs were gone, but we didn't know what happened to men. So I said, I'll go back and see if they're all out. So I, and you go, you go out the front, and I'll go out to Bombay, but I'll check first. So I get back, and the engineer was gone. I looked around the gunners. They were gone, gone. I said, to God, they're all gone. We didn't tell them to get out. They just got out on their own. I don't blame them, as a matter of fact, but when the way the airplane was <laughs> gyrating. But uh, Is this thing on automatic pilot while you're walking back yeah, toward the north? Yeah, we're trying to get it on automatic. Yes, it okay. was, but I don't know how much good it did. So by now, I'm, uh, I thought I was the only one in the car because the others slid out the front, the only one in the airplane. I looked down to the Bombay and it looked kind of ominous down there. Snow on the ground. And then I looked up and, and the tail gunner came up through and he said, what's the matter? I said, my God, you back there shooting all the time while the others hopped out on you? He said, yeah. I said, we got to jump. And he looked down and he was a little reluctant to jump. I said, you got to jump. And right then, da 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 the whole string, and I felt something hit me in the head like we were hit with a hammer and then the blood began to run down and he jumped and I jumped and when I jumped out I started to tumble I said Jesus I, you know I could die I'm not, I don't know whether I'm going to be blind or I can't see I better pull a chute you shouldn't pull your chute because that's then that tells the Germans where you are because they watch you going down or they even might shoot you. I didn't know they did. I don't think they did. But they didn't, they could find you easily because they followed you if, you if you floated down. So you were supposed to pull your chute as soon as you could. So, uh, so free fall as far as you could, in other words. So I pulled my chute, and it wasn't that I was going blind, but the blood had frozen in my eyes when I was tumbling and froze my eyes shut so I couldn't see. So I realized that, well, I'm alive, uh, at least for a while. And uh, now the chute had pulled, and I looked around. It's a nice, easy ride. Uh, and I saw our old aircraft, five by five, slump right into New Elm, which is in Germany, southern Germany. You now, watched your plane crash. Yeah, right in the center of the city. And uh, I went on down then, well, two farmers who were there with guns. 
They took me in the house. The lady worked on my head, did a pretty good job, bandaged it up. And then shortly, the two Luftwaffe guards came along, came and ordered me out. Meanwhile, just before that, there was a little girl there. She's about 11. She could speak good English. Because the Germans at that age, they were all learning English in school. So I said, uh, how far is it to Switzerland? And she said, I don't know how many kilometers she said, but I, oh God, the chance of me getting a Swiss, but I was going to try it. But the two, guard, two uh, Luftwaffe's guards came in, and they took, there was snow on the ground. It's February 25th. They took me out and started back to the barracks. Am I going too fast? Too, no, too sir, much time? you're doing fine. We started back to the barracks. And they stopped, and the leather flying jacket for all the pilots like that leather flying jacket. You know, you still have, some still have it. So they 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 said jacket, you know, German, whatever it is. I said nine nine, I'll see it. Yeah yeah, and they backed up and clicked those rifles back. You know, Germans when they click it back. Those rifles, the two of them there standing with a rifle pointing at me, one in my jacket. Well, I, I gave him the jacket. You decided to make a good decision yeah. there, didn't you? Yeah. That's right. Can so. I in interject to ask a question? If you had made Switzerland, what was the rule for internment of American flyers? This was uh, February 25th, 1944, so the war still had quite a way to go. Yeah. What would have happened to you in Switzerland? Well, we think it would have been real nice. All those nice Swiss girls and all that whiskey and so forth. Uh, we expected a pretty good time because, the, and of course the Germans were there, some German pilots were there, American pilots, the French or whatever. So they lived well. Better than what least, happened to you. I, oh, yeah. yes. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. What happened to you after you very graciously surrendered your jacket? Uh, they took me in and uh, they, they worked, the Germans worked on it, on my wound. If there was any metal in there, they took it out. But they did say to me, you were very lucky. My head had been that far, that way, that six inches, I would have been dead. You survived by inches, didn't you? Yeah. Then you bailed out and right. into enemy territory. Yeah. Um, somebody sent you somewhere for interrogations. What happened next? Oh my God, that was. Yes, they did. We stayed there overnight. The next morning, uh, we they took us down to the train station, and, and we went through an off ordeal because there was a crowd of people there. They wanted to hang us. I don't blame them. We just bombed the hell out of the city. And of course, we didn't hit the city, but the rest of them did. And the British came over at night. So uh, we got on the train finally. They took us to uh, uh, Frankfurt, Germany, who was the headquarters of the uh, interrogation. And uh, it took us about, it took us 24 hours to get there. And right there, of course, they took all your clothes off and search you completely, and immediately plopped into solitary confinement. You sit, solitary confinement is a six by nine room with a cot. No table, no toilet, no water, no nothing. Just a cot and a blanket. And on the wall it says, the big sign says, if you destroy anything in this room, you'll be shot. And as you know, it's kind of like dusk. It is, it, it, the window is opaque. One window is in that's opaque. And then in the morning, uh, they'd come and give you two pieces of bread. If you had to go to the bathroom, you had to knock on the door and wait and wait and wait, and finally they'll take you. Uh, and then lunchtime, and you got some of the worm soup. The first soup I got, I looked at it, and it was these little yellow things. And my God, I realized it was the head of worms in, in the barley soup. Uh, I sent it back. But after about two or three days, I, I didn't send it back anymore. 
So Are you in contact with any other prisoners? No, uh, none. You were alone, solitary. None. Solitary confinement. And you never saw any during the course of the day? Nothing. Nobody. They wouldn't even, you know, just open the door and give you the stuff. And that is, God, of all the things that you could die of, I, I, to think of staying in solitary, I only had a week of it, but, but the point is you didn't know what the hell you were going to, what was going to happen. You know, the, the bombers would go, well, they were bombing Frankfurt. Our own people were bombing Frankfurt. There we are, right in the middle of the center of Frankfurt. Uh, but anyway, uh, after, oh, I, I want me to tell you about the interrogation? Sure. This is most interesting. I don't know if I'm taking too much time, am I? We'll move along. Go right I, ahead. They came and got me after about four days, two guards. They marched me in, out of the building and upstairs into another adjoining building and into this big room. And sitting there, if you ever saw a picture, a, a movie picture of a Russian, I mean a German officer, this was it. Black boots, the trousers, you know, the way are, uh, the iron cross pinned on him, everything spick and span, little mustache. Little cut here on the side of his face. Oh, the saber cut, yeah. yeah. Uh, good morning, Lieutenant Donovan. How are you this fine morning? And how do you think they're doing out there? Well, very good, sir. Rank serial number is all I can tell you. Yes, I know. That's right. That's what they tell you. But they're there and you're here, and there's a difference. But anyway, uh, I want to show you some things and ask you some questions. As a matter of fact, it says I don't need to, I don't know if you need to ask you too many. We know more than you know anyway. In fact, he said, you know, you went to uh, the Gulf Coast Training Center in Texas. That's where you graduated. You kindled over there named Colonel Smith. He's a big, big guy, kindled of your unit. He said, anything more you want to know, let me know. And incidentally, he said, look at this. There's your airplane. He had, it was on the map. He said, There's your airplane, and there, and it shows you flying across. That he had a line, and he says that's where the line stopped. That's where you stopped. Uh, I said I only want one to know a couple of things, because I, as I said, I know more than you know. He said, uh, Why uh, did you come to bomb Stuttgart, and where were you located? Where's your, your unit? I said, Dame Rank and serial number. Oh, he said, I know that, I know that. But you're gonna have to answer these questions. He said, you know, there's something ahead for you. Uh, football, baseball, play outside, have a nice place to live and warm barracks. All that's yours if you'll only cooperate. I said, well, my name, rank, and serial number. Well, after this, quite a bit of that, he said, Go back, go back, and I can remember this distinctly, and stay there till your beard gets as long as a, a German officer's, a German admiral, or whatever they call him. Uh, so I went back and I said, Jesus, I don't know. Warren, how did he know these things about you? Uh, how did you know what? How did he know where you had been trained and the name of your commanding Is, officer? You, you know, isn't that thing? a... Isn't that, when you get faced by that, what do you think? You think, my God, they do more than I know. You know, it's, it's a real shocker to have somebody, a genuine enemy say, yeah, you're Warren F. Donovan, you went to, you see, they had spies in the United States, we'll learn later. And if there was a, like the paper, in the big cities, the papers published, well, Lieutenant Warren F. Donovan graduated, da, 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 you know, they would clip that and send it back over to the files over in Germany, and they'd have you. They had a lot of them. Mm. God, they were. So I'm, I'm assuming that you got out of this solitary place, and my notes here said that you were sent to a um, camp for officers at a place called Barth. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. That's correct. 
And Barth is way up north in Germany. I have right on the Baltic. And if yeah, and you can look across it. See There's Sweden. A, Denmark or Sweden, Sweden over there. Yes. There's a lighthouse across the way that you could see. Tell us about going into a camp like that, and where, and who, how many guys were with you? Were you yeah. truck loads or train loads? I just wanted to tell you one more incident because it's so interesting about the interrogation. Uh, after about a week, they came and got me again, and he said. Uh, he said, I'm not going to, Leutnant, I'm not going to fool around with you. I'm going to give you a chance. He says, the, the British and Americans are dropping spies in Germany. And Germans can, and spies can be shot. You know that, under the Geneva Convention. Yes, sir. I'm going to assume you're a spy. So you're going to be shot. Now I'll give you a choice. You tell me what I want to know. And I won't, because I have to know that. I have to know that you're a military person. I, th I'm, I think you're a spy. But you've proved to me that you're a military man, and then I won't have to shoot you. So you just answer the questions. And the, I'll, it takes too long to tell you all about the questioning. What I know is why are you bombing cities like the Russians, like the, the British? You used to bomb targets used to be railroad cars, or it used to be factories, but you've been bombing the cities, killing the German people just like the British. Why is that? And there's a whole story to that, but it would take me an hour to tell you why that was. But that's quite a decision to make. But two days later, they took me out anyway. And we went into the 40 and 8 car that you were talking about, which was made for, what was it? Forty men and eight mules, I believe. That's right. And no ventilation, one loaf of bread, no latrine situation, only in the corner. And I guess they dang near got the forty of men in there. And that took four or five days. And once in a while they'd stop and open the door. But every you'd hear the fighters coming over and they're hearing them bombing. <laughs> it didn't seem to make much difference. Uh, they kept going till they got the bath. This is February of uh, 1944. You're in a prisoner of war camp. Is that correct? That, yes. Is that correct? Yes. Date? Yes. <clears throat> Christmas, you said. Uh, well, uh, you were shot down in February yeah. of 44. Yeah. And I assume the interrogation took a couple of weeks and then the train. Yes, ride. That's, that's about right, yeah. So. 1944, this is even before the invasion. Yes. And you're in a camp. Yes. With other pilots, were they all pilots? Uh, all, uh, well, the British, yes. There were some uh, enlisted men who did the work, but the, uh, all the officers were there. So you've got um, 44, 45. You've got about a year and three or four months. That's right. What did you do, Warren? While we were in there, we made a, a couple of us made a resolution we were going to try to keep fit. So we walked around the compound. It might have been three quarters of a mile. We'd go twice, constant, every day. Every day we did that. Um, we had, there were some books there. But much of the time it was just 18 men in a room, well, not a little bigger than this, because it would be four beds, one, two, one that way. It would be five beds like against that wall. So it was a little bigger than this, but there was 18 men in there, so you can tell. And of course we had to, whatever we had, we had to cook ourselves. They would throw some turnips out, or potatoes, and we outside the door, and we have to go to the door, and they had a little cook with a little, little bit of coal, you know, coal stove. We had to cook our own, and, but it was the most monotonous time. And uh, I wish I'd have had the. Uh, I tried to learn this language as something useful, but I can tell you this: when you're cold and really, really hungry, 
you don't have much ambition to do much of anything. I, sh I think we should say that uh, you wrote a marvelous book about your experiences, and w we here in, in the library have read it. Um, it's filled with detail about your time in the camp, and a, a very apparent in this is the deterioration of your situation because Germany was losing the war. They couldn't even feed their own people. No. Uh, you were in a place that was terribly, terribly cold and the food situation got bad. Can you talk about that last winter? That was, would be the winter of 1945 and your time in the camp before uh, the Russians changed your life? Yes. The last two or three months? Yes, sir. Of course, food was getting very short. And the Red Cross, you know, used to send parcels. And it contained um, crackers and uh, some chocolate and cigarettes. cigarettes. Cigarettes were the most valuable thing you could have uh, to trade with the Germans. Uh, and it had other canned stuff. It, was, it would keep you alive, these uh, parcels. Anyway. Um, they became short. They were stuffing, they were left in a big warehouse. The Germans couldn't deliver them to us, they said. So, God, we got so, so horribly hungry. And uh, then we figured, what are we going to do? Uh, we could hear the guns of the Soviets. The Soviet was over about in, um, Stettin or Staten, however you want to say it, Staten, um, which are maybe 70, 80 kilometers to the east. And then the British were coming in from the other side. So we were sort of in, in between. And we said, my God, it looks to me as though that we're going to be right in the, the guns are firing and we're going to be right in the middle as these two forces clash. Uh, uh, that began to worry us an awful lot. Then it was with the food, the little bit of food, how much shall we eat? Shall we try to save some? So even though we, we don't know what's going to be ahead, maybe it'll be worse. Maybe the food situation will get worse. Um, we, didn't, we, we didn't have any news much of what, what was going on, except it was German, and uh, even that wasn't much at that time because they were they were losing the war. It was, it was a rather horrible existence uh, to be worried about it and be, have nothing to eat. Some of the people, were, some of them uh, would, couldn't walk. I mean, they were just lying, you know, they could wiggle around and uh, there wasn't any, just you had one sink for 18 people in that room. There was a toilet adjacent, adjacent to the room. It, it was difficult. Because of the, the timing of what you've just described, uh, the um, Russian army coming through Poland and up of, uh, in, in northern Germany, yes. the British approaching, uh, you stood a good chance of dying before anything changed, or timing was everything in your life. Yes. Um, can you tell us who finally came to the door of the prison? Who opened the gates? We went to bed one night. They, they come down around uh, as soon as the uh, uh, it became dusk. They close up. We had a window in our big room, one big window, just one big window. They would come up and close that so you couldn't see out, and lock it, and uh, we were in for the night. And the next morning, we got up at about five or six o'clock when we usually w were awakened, and the window was still closed. I hadn't opened the window, but the lights were working. So we would know it was dangerous to go venture out, the, go outside the barracks. You knew that. We knew to find out what was wrong. There must be something wrong. But we finally, as this time went on and nothing was happening, we went on and opened the door, and there was nothing. No guards in the towers with machine guns, 
No dogs, German walking around with German dogs, nothing. And we said, what, what is this? What, what has happened? And uh, we went out, of course, we were highly elated. We were, they, they left us. They just went away and left us. But it wasn't long before, um, what do you call, Marshal Semenowski and his crew came, the Soviets. And uh, our, our uh, colonel uh, was afraid to let us go out because he said that they'll, you'll get killed, you'll get into trouble, you'll get into fights, you'll be hungry, you'll be stealing stuff. You've got to stay in. But the uh, marshal, they interpreted it for us after, came up and said, what's the matter with these men? Of course, there were Soviets in there. There were 30 or 40 Soviet prisoners, too. He said, uh, why aren't these men out? And the colonel said, well, we were afraid they might get into trouble and so forth and so forth. He said, bring me an axe. So he was, God went over and brought an axe. Of course, he wasn't going to chop it down, but he was symbolic. He was saying, chop that stick, open that door. Of course, he's a marshal. We only got a colonel. So the Soviets ran the show. So up we went, some of us. But they brought food, they cooked stuff. They, they, they got some guys, there were some Texans in there. And we got some German horses, I'll never forget this. And they went out, they rounded up some cattle. And it was like Wild West. There's these prisoners riding horses, four or five horses, and they're herding the cattle into the, where the Russians were. The whole Russian army was there. And they were going to slaughter those, and, and we had, and we did have meat. You had a barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> in your book, you make quite clear that the Russians also brought an ample supply of vodka. Oh, indeed. And that, uh, again, graciously, you accepted their hospitality. Yes. You all got drunk. Yeah. That's right. When I went with them. You I'll had a couple of, of the, they took the British out first, if I understand you correctly, because they'd been in there the longest ever since uh, Dunkirk, way, yes. way back then. Yes. So you guys had a few days then to just walk around. That's right. Tell us about that. You're, you're free after a year and a half. Yes. Well, the first thing, the bath was about big city. In fact, the church there was from 1690 built. And it would, had been Catholic at one time. Now it was Lutheran, I guess, or whatever it was. But it just changed the religion, the same church. Big, beautiful uh, church. But we walked out and started walking towards town and this Russian uh, wagon, they, mostly all wagons then, or, or what they had was Chevrolets and Fords, trucks back then. And if they were driving a Chevrolet or Ford truck and they, they gave us an armband, you know, said Amerikansky, they would stop the truck and they said, oh, comrade, Tavarich. And uh, then they pat the truck, good, good, Amerikansky. They were so proud to have those Fords and Chevrolets. Come, well, their old juggernauts were still chain driven. Can you imagine that? They were still, the trucks that they flew they had were chain driven, you know, a chain <laughs> back and Like the old Mack trucks. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. right. So we were free to roam the countryside and uh, and enjoy whatever we could. They were friendly and you could get off, they had stuff to eat. Uh, I remember one, the first day we got on the wagon with uh, some Russians, three or four, and they had, we kept saying, yes, we wanted something to eat because we hadn't had much to eat. And then da 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 da, yes, yes, wait. And it got to be dusk and they pulled off the side of the road from the rest of the stream of the wagons going. I don't know where they were going, but... And uh, there was a house there, and uh, they walked up to the house, and it was getting dusk, and they jammed the butt of the gun against that door, bang, bang, bang. Nothing happened. Then they clicked back those rifles. Well, we got behind the horses. Uh, uh, it was Fallon and me, the two of us. Uh, my friend Fallon was a navigator. 
And they banged it again, and then it was this poor old German couple came out, and they had the, the German headset on, and they, you know, they, well, they wear a cap going to bed. Nightcap. Nightcap. And they ran off in the woods. And that's when we went in, and, and with the Russians, you don't take a cocktail and sip it. With the Russians, they pour you a glass like that, and you drink it all, all at one time. That was the custom with the vodka. They had plenty of vodka in the basement and plenty of food in the house, Schwab's, whatever you wanted. And uh, they'd say, okay, Stalin, Churchill, Roosevelt, down the hatch. I remember doing that. And then the next thing I know, I woke up in bed on the floor, and the Russians had gone. I was there by myself, and the other guy, who Fallon, and I were there. <laughs> they just put us to bed and went off. <laughs> Can you tell me then how eventually you rejoined civilization? Um, did you turn yourself into some unit and become part of the Air Force again, or how did you make contact with the Americans? Um, okay. There was a big, I don't want to take too much time, but there was a big controversy over that. Uh, our colonel said, we're going to fly these men out. And so did, what was his name? The guy, the big guy in the, back then, who was running the whole thing. I think that was Doolittle, maybe? Doolittle. Yeah. Jimmy Doolittle was running the whole thing. And um, the, the, uh, the Russians said, oh, no, nine, nine, you're going to go the way we want you. We're going to march you to the station, the railroad station about three miles away. Then we're going to take you back to somewhere, I think Moscow, I think, or someplace back there, back in Russia. Then they're going to take us down and take, take us to the Black Sea, where we get into the Navy, the American Navy. <laughs> well, there was a big argument over that. And uh, uh, our, our colonel said, no, we're going to fly them out. And uh, the uh, marshal said, no, we're going to do what we want to do. I, if I'm going to take too much time, I'll quit. But anyway, it was a big back and forth and back and forth. And finally, Doodle said, look, I'm coming in with fighters and bombers, and I'm taking those men out. And the marshal, in effect, said, well, if you want it that way, OK. So that's the way we got out. We took turn, they took the injured out first and flew us to Lucky Strike, which is a rehabilitation center in France. Lucky Strike? Yeah. <clears throat> and you were rehabilitated, I take it. Yes. And, um, how did you get back to the States eventually? I didn't think we did flew you sail back. back or fly back? I think we were flown back. Yeah, I think we were flown back. Now, one, one thing I neglected to ask you, how did you tell your family you were safe and sound? How did you tell them you were free and coming home? Now, how did that happen? Could we get a send of, I had, in that book I had it, maybe I'd have it. I can't remember just how that was, whether the, the Red Cross did it, probably the Red Cross did it. Because, uh, they got it. They got the message, all right. But I don't. I think it was the Red Cross probably wired it or phoned it. Or That's good. You came back to the states, and um, what was your rank by this time? Was you second lieutenant? Second lieutenant? No, first lieutenant. I had been promoted that till the end of the. All right. And what decorations had you uh, been awarded? Gosh, I had quite a few. I can't remember them all. I wrote them down. And, in the somewhere, but I did have the the uh, air medal. It was a cluster, which means that's equivalent of two. I did have a purple heart, um, POW medal. Thank you. Um, I, I've just been handed here. May I go through the list uh, yes. for you here? Thank you, Barbara. Uh, purple heart for having been wounded. Air Medal and Cluster, uh, the Ex-Prisoner of War Medal, Distinguished Unit Citation for your bomb group, European Theater Medal, 
American Theater Medal, Reserve Longevity Medal, Armed Forces Medal, and the Victory Medal. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's pretty good stuff. Thank you. I'm going to ask you a question here that uh, you know is coming. Uh, can you tell us about one character in your military history that stands out more than any other? Well, of course, that interrogator stands out, but I will tell you another. Let's see, it's an interesting one that uh, I'm going to tell you about, but it may not be the most standout one. But it won't take but a minute. Uh, we call the gods goons. I don't know how we not. I, you may remember there used to be a goon in the funny papers. It was a, a yes, Alice. Yeah, was her it? name was Alice. Yeah, is that right? Well, it was a goon, and uh, you know they were um, you know it looked like a, somebody from Mars. It was an ugly, very ugly thing. So we called the uh, gods goons. We always had a fellow on the door. He had to take two hours at a time and say, "Goon up!" That meant the god was coming. Because in our, our barracks, we would dig in a tunnel. We were down in the sand. And they'd bring the sand back, and we would put it in our pocket and go out. And then when we got out of sight of the gods, we'd let the sand go on the earth. So, uh, so we had a god. But this day, this uh, German major came up. And uh, he, not, he, had, he always had two guys on with rifles, you know, two, two regular soldiers. He can, uh, regular, you spick and span, knocked on the door. Didn't, didn't usually do that. We went to the door, he stood there, and the two guys stood there. He said, Was ist das Goon? <laughs> what is a goon? Yeah. <laughs> Jeez, what are we going to do? And then with somebody, a guy from New York, I think, he went to push his way out and he said, In the United States, there's some very important people. And they're looked up to by everybody else. And we call those people goons. Ah, he said, das ist gut. And the guys put their rifles down and he moved away. You realize he went through the rest of his life calling people goons. Yeah. <laughs> I also think there's something significant here that uh, we generally ask, was there a humorous experience that you could share with us? And you write on your papers, none. And I can appreciate that, considering what you went through in the last year. But is there one incident, one outstanding thing in your military career that, above all else, you'd like to tell us about today? There are a number of things I've done. Uh, that might be humorous, but uh, beyond humor, what would you make want to make very sure that we hear about today that perhaps I haven't even asked you? One incident that you recall, perhaps. Well, outside of the one that you, I talked to you about, the, the communication for Doolittle, that was quite a... And, and this is in the military, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm trying to think of... There were several. There was the, uh, the story of the bathroom. I don't know. That was in my book, but it might take a little time to tell that. That was a very humorous. The bathroom? Yeah. Is this the ladies? Yes. Why don't you tell that? We'll end on a very happy note. All right. Um, there was a bathroom outside of the compound uh, that they would take us to in groups, maybe once a month. Later on, it got to be hardly any, but early on. And uh, it was really, it was like a gas chamber. They had these things that came out of the wall, about eight or nine of them, 
and they'd line us up at six, eight or nine guys, and, and they turn the whole thing on, and then march out the other day, out the other side. So one day, it was a nice day, people were walking around, and somebody said, women, women with no clothes on. God, here's people who had been in the fair, the Germans, maybe a year and a half, haven't even seen a woman, let alone a woman without clothes. What so the they heck? got your attention, I take it. Beg your pardon? I, I take it they got your attention. <laughs> yeah, they sure did. So the rush goes to the, against the fence. Just everybody in that thousand men in that compound out against the fence, facing toward the bathroom. And there the women were. Whole string of them, no clothes on. Soldiers, guns, marching along to take a shower. And the women looked over at us, and we waved back, and they waved at us, and boy, that fence began to surge. Because everybody was there. And the women, of course, had no clothes on, as the rumor said. They were the ladies that worked in the factories and so forth, the Czechs and the French and the Polish and so forth that they had captured. But anyway, by that time, the Germans were getting a little itchy about this, so they took all of the guards out of the compound, in the compound, along with the dogs, and along with whatever guard, the guards they had, and they, because this fence was going like that. The front guys were getting beaten up off of what the fence was moving. And he lined up on the other side, had a big bull horn. He said, I'll give you 10 minutes for every one of you to get back in the barracks. Any that are out will be shot. And we got back into the barracks in 10 minutes. I can tell you that. Warren, thank you. That's a great thank story.